Hi, and welcome to Reed's Audio Reading. I'm Reed, and I hope you enjoy my channel. Today, I'll be reading the module Bloodstone Pass, specifically Chapter 4. This module was written by Douglas Niles and Michael Dobson. Chapter 4. Preparations for War Audience with the Baron The audience with the Baron takes place the first night the characters arrive. Just after sunset, Garland and Garvin, recently bathed and dressed in their finery, arrive at the Inn of the Clowns to escort the characters to the Baronal Manor for dinner. The characters are expected to dress well, armor and weapons are not appropriate. The dinner is held in the state dining room of the manor. Attending are the Baron Tranth, his daughter Lady Christine, Quillen the Sage, and Abbot Aldrich. When the adventurers enter, the Baron thanks Garland and Garvin for their service, then dismisses them. They bow and depart. The Baron then turns to the adventurers and says, Welcome to our poor realm. We are in desperate need for succor, and our gratitude for your presence knows no bound. He introduces the other guests and then suggests that everyone be seated. The dinner consists of several courses, all brought out in their turn by servants. The appetizer course consists of eels in aspic, fish sausage, and oxtail soup. For the main course, individual stuffed quails are served, followed by a suckling pig on a silver platter, wine pudding, bread pudding, and Yorkshire pudding, with roast vegetables on the side. A broth is served to clear the palate following the main course. Then comes a cheese board laden with fruits, a large tray of pastries, and various rich puddings. With the meal, servants bring out a variety of red and white wines, distilled liquors, and other spirits. During the dinner, the baron turns away any attempt at serious conversation, and instead asks the adventurers to tell stories of their greatest exploits. He listens attentively to any stories told. During dinner, the baron extends an invitation to any and all PCs, inviting them to stay in his home while they are in the village. Following dessert, the servants escort the dinner guests into the red sitting room and serve brandy and individual pipes filled with fine tobaccos. The baron explains the situation to the adventurers, then invites questions. The baron, the sage, or the abbot, as appropriate, answer any questions to the best of their ability. Be sure and review the character descriptions of the participants so that their responses are appropriate to their personalities. If the questioning runs into unexpected areas, use your best judgment based on your knowledge of the character and situation. If the players are clever, they can learn a great deal from this session. If they are not, they may miss some critical information. The raiders began operating in the mountains approximately 20 years ago, but were only a minor problem until about 5 years ago when the Kingdom of Vasa won its first major victories. Refugees swelled the ranks of the raiders, and within a matter of months, the bandits had become an army. The grandfather of assassins and his henchmen entered into an unholy alliance with these bandits, and built them into a functioning army that already dominates the Bloodstone Pass, and soon could expand to dominate the baronies and duchies throughout the south. When it became clear that the bandit army could easily destroy the villagers, the baron sued for peace and agreed to pay an annual tribute. His people may go hungry during the long winter, but at least they are alive. He gave up hope of resistance and settled for survival until last year. Last year, the bandits took an additional tribute of slaves, young women, and some of the stronger young men. It was then that the Baron resolved to seek aid from the outside world. According to the Baron, the bandit army is well-trained and approximately 1,200 strong. Its members include humans, orcs, goblins, and similar scum. The Baron has also seen wyverns, giants, and other monsters. He knows that the enemy force has at least one high-level magic user and one high-level cleric, but he doesn't know any details. The army is commanded by the Grandfather of Assassins, and many of the sub-commanders are also assassins. The assassins have been known to spy on the village, and it is believed that there may be agents among the villagers, but there are no strong suspects. The Baron does not know the location of the enemy camp, but believes it can be in the mountains to the east. If the characters captured the orcs in Chapter 2, those orcs can be forced to reveal the location of the camp. Similarly, the spy Jameson, if caught, can reveal the location. The Baron is uncomfortable with the idea of attacking the enemy camp, convinced that it would be simply suicide. 
The Baron is technically the ruler of the entire valley, which includes the communities of dwarves, halflings, and centaurs. His relations with the demi-humans are cordial, but they are as intimidated by the bandits as he is. They cannot be counted upon as allies, but he suggests that they should be approached for aid. The citizens of Bloodstone have been organized into a loose military structure. The adventurers can modify the force structure if desired. The villagers can be trained, and they can also be used to build fortifications or weapons, if the adventurers so desire. The Baron is certain to mention that only half of his force is of good quality. The other half is merely militia, and casualties among the militia will have dangerous effect on the morale of the village. The Baron will place the entire village at the character's beck and call. Morale is low since these people fear for their lives, but the Baron is convinced that if the villagers once taste victory, they will become invincible. In previous years, the bandits have sent a small force to collect tribute just the following harvest. The force is normally small, consisting of 100 to 200 humans or humanoids, a few more powerful monsters such as giants, and horses and pack mules to cart away the harvest. Their normal procedure is to halt their main body out of town, and then their leaders ride in to meet with the Baron. The Baron and other leading citizens must meet the visitors on foot and are sometimes degraded by the enemy. The villagers cart out the harvest under supervision and load it on the pack animals. The enemy leaders normally keep their men disciplined, but once the tribute force rode into town and raised hell, burning huts, killing helpless people, and stealing anything of value they could find. But the leaders try not to allow this so that the villagers will continue to produce so they can be shorn each year, like proper sheep. As one enemy commander put it, the Baron cautions the adventurers that there is danger in attacking the tribute force, for if even a single man escapes to tell the enemy leader what happened, the bandits will spare no effort to ensure that the village is wiped out to the last man, woman, and child. The audience lasts as long as the player's characters wish. When they have asked all questions they desire, the Baron offers to meet with them at need, then wishes the party a pleasant good night. After this session is concluded, determine where each PC intends to set up sleeping and living quarters. The primary option are the Inn of the Clowns and the Baronal Mansion. Also, determine any special routine precautions that the PCs intend to take on a nightly basis. Make notes about the PCs' actions, since you will need this information later during the Midnight Attack scenario. Encounter Reactions The characters must make successful encounter reaction checks to win over the villagers, win over Abbot Aldrich, and win over the various potential allies to their cause. How to make the encounter reaction check is explained in the Dungeon Master Guide, page 63. Certain special encounter modifiers are listed in this adventure. Use the charisma reaction adjustment of either the speaker or the party member with the highest charisma as appropriate. The instructions also say to adjust the percentile dice result by applicable loyalty results as if the creature were a henchman of the character speaking. Use the following modifiers only. Length of association training or status level, pay or treasures shared, only if gifts or bribes are offered, otherwise omit. General treatment by liege, start with just and a variable and modify by circumstances, racial preferences, alignment factors, alignment of liege, alignment of character speaking, and special conditions. At the DM's discretion, add or subtract any other modifiers that would reasonably affect the reaction. Characters can make a new encounter reaction check every time something happens that significantly changes the modifier. Once the adjusted die score is 76 or greater, that person, tribe, or village has been won over. If the PCs lose a battle or behave badly, you can, at your discretion, require a new encounter reaction check at a lower modifier. Role-playing in Bloodstone as the characters interact with the citizens of Bloodstone and pursue preparations for war, certain subplots may develop. Feel free to use some, all, or none of the following, depending on the actions of the characters. You may also create your own subplots, again, depending on the characters. 1. Lady Christine Lady Christine, normally a proud and somewhat cool woman, falls in love with the fighter or fighter subclass character with the highest charisma. If there is a tie, the character with the alignment closest to neutral good is chosen. 
Later, Christine shows her affection by seeking out the object of her love when he is training or supervising villagers and watching him. She has her servants bring him delicious lunches whenever he is near the village. She asks him to meet her for an important secret meeting, and it turns out that she has laid out a sumptuous picnic by the lake. She invites him to a private candlelight dinner and praises his prowess as a warrior. If the player character makes improper, rude, or lewd advances to her, she is completely turned off and chooses another love. If the player character t returns her affection in a proper and gentlemanly fashion, and if the player characters succeeded in their mission, the Baron suggests that he would approve of the marriage between the two. Lady Christine will gladly accept such a marriage proposal, and the fighter who marries her will be knighted and automatically be the heir to the entire barony. 2. Abbot Aldrich of St. Solars it becomes apparent at the dinner that Abbot Aldrich is actively opposed to the presence of the adventurers. He believes that suffering is natural and that one should welcome it in the tradition of the holy twice martyred one. Resistance, he believes, is futile and will only bring a terrible retribution. Hoping that he can stir up opposition to the heroes and thus force them to leave, he is seen in private conversations and suspicious-looking with leading characters. He goes on nighttime walks outside the village. Actually, he is only meditating, allowing the players to suspect that Aldrich is a spy. Actually, Aldrich is quite loyal and can be won over. At first, he has a minus 40% penalty to an encounter reaction roll. Each time the characters win a battle or make a positive attempt to win the abbot over, make a new encounter reaction roll for the abbot with a cumulative 20% bonus per attempt. No more than one encounter reaction check per five days can be made. If the abbot is won over, he will use his rod of resurrection to resurrect any PC who is killed. Otherwise, he will not even admit that he has that power. 3. Halden the Thief Halden is a very sleazy character who tries to integrate himself with any characters who frequent the tavern. He runs errands, provides gossip, frequently inaccurate, and he always says what he thinks the listener wants to hear, and tries excessively hard to convince the heroes of his loyalty. He's actually a traitor. He does not know that Jameson is an assassin, but he has passed information to the enemy when they have sent their tribute collectors, hoping to integrate himself with the most powerful people around. He believes that the heroes must lose, and always wants to be on the winning side. He will sneak out of town and try to warn any attacking forces, and may even try to sabotage a key element of the town's defenses. Play Halden carefully, and give the heroes a reasonable chance to discover him if they are actively searching for potential traitors. If caught, he makes up excuses, passes blame, accuses innocent people, whines and whimpers, and pleads for mercy. If sufficiently threatened, bribed, or persuaded, he can be turned to betray his former masters. 4. Jameson the Spy Jameson the Fletcher makes it his business to know about any strange happenings. He frequently used Halden as a source of rumors, though realizes that Halden is too sleazy to be reliable. He learns almost immediately that Garland and Garvin succeeded in their missions, and that they have brought back much more powerful adventures than he had thought was possible. He is sitting at the bar at the Inn of the Clowns when the characters arrive. He asks personal questions about background, powers, levels, and alignment, and asks spellcasters to demonstrate their powers. He always buys drinks. Once he gets basic information, he leaves the village at midnight carrying a hooded falcon. Tied to the leg of the falcon is a report of the adventurers. The falcon is released, flies directly to the enemy camp. Jameson sends a message every three nights following the arrival of the villagers. At dawn, the morning after Jameson sent the first message, a falcon flies into his house with a message from the grandfire saying, Neutralize visitors immediately. Extreme prejudice. Report soonest. Jameson then sets up traps to try to kill the adventurers. First, a loose stone from the town gate falls on top of any character who passes underneath. Hit as 10 HD monster. DMG 4 to 40. Inspection shows that there is a line of thin rope leading into the village. Someone must have rigged it to fall. The second attempt is that a meal in the inn is poisoned. Save or die in 2 to 7 rounds. 
interrogations of the staff reveals that they all left the kitchen for a minute because of a commotion outside. When they went outside, nothing was there. Make up additional murder attempts as needed. Jameson has a hollow tooth filled with a very caustic, very poisonous acid. He resists capture by committing suicide. If somehow captured alive, he cannot be persuaded or forced to talk except by a magical means, such as ESP or a charm person spell. The acid does such severe damage to his tongue that if Jameson commits suicide and a speak with dead spell is cast upon him, he will not be able to articulate understandable speech. 5. Four Young Boys Four young boys, names and personalities at random, attach themselves to the strongest character in the group. They follow him around constantly, offering to carry his weapons and run his errands, and hero-worshipping him in the most ostentatious way possible. They ask him innocent questions about his past, how many monsters he has killed, etc. They sometimes get underfoot and may even rush out to his defense in battle, possibly getting hurt themselves in the process. The boys are all zero-level humans, HP 1 to 3. 6. Raquel and Carlotta Raquel and Carlotta, the two barmaids at the end of the clowns, are flirtatious but politely refuse any pass or improper advance. However, they have one weakness, music. If any male character, such as a bard, plays a musical instrument or sings, both girls are instantly smitten and immediately play up to that character. The characters are not jealous of each other. A character can have a relationship with both of them at the same time. 7. Stefan the Innkeeper Stefan is friendly, but keeps his own counsel. He is not actively won over. He is still supportive, friendly, and helpful. If he is actively won over, he places his great wisdom and knowledge fully in the service of the PCs. He would make a fine unit commander or aide-de-camp, because he has traveled far and has been a professional mercenary, as well as a thief. He can give useful advice, DM's discretion, about the wide range of matters. To win Stefan over, a character must beat him at a drinking contest. Stefan, a man with a mighty thirst for ale, frequently brags about his prowess as a drinker. If a character claims to be a good drinker, Stefan immediately challenges him to a drinking contest. To calculate each character's performance in the drinking contest, take the base con score, add 3 if the character has been known as a heavy drinker, and 2 more if the character is fat. A character can drink up to one-third of this modified cons score, rounded up, in shots of whiskey or equivalent, with no effect. With the next shot of whiskey, the characters become slightly intoxicated. As soon as this happens, the characters must make a modified con check by rolling 1d20 for each additional drink he takes. A result of 20 is always a failure. If the check fails, the character's state of intoxication worsens from one form, slight to moderate, to great to comatose. Whenever a check is failed, the character's current modified con score decreases by 4. The first character who becomes comatose loses the contest. Resolve this contest with dice. Hot role-playing. 8. Gabrielle Gabrielle is the oldest daughter of Benjamin and Anne, the town bakers. She has Intelligence 16 and Charisma 17, and has a burning desire to become a magic user. She is fond of older men and would gladly apprentice herself as a servant to a magic user if he would only train her in the magical arts. She is romantic but basically chaste and shy. If treated well and encouraged, she will become a fine wife. 9. The Lake Midai Monster The villagers never venture out onto Lake Midai, although they fish in it and use its fresh, pure water. A dragon turtle lives in the depths of the lake. The dragon turtle considers the lake to be its private preserve and tries to capsize any ship that ventures out onto the lake. It never bothers anyone on the land. The dragon turtle has the incentive benefit of preventing the enemy from crossing the lake and invading the town from the rear. If the dragon turtle is defeated, the villager encounter reaction adjustment increases by plus 20%. Abbot Aldrich is also impressed, and his reaction adjustment increases as described above. The dragon turtle has a nest on the bottom of the lake in its very center. It has a treasure gleaned from ships and men that ventured out into the lake of 10,000 gold pieces, 
20,000 silver pieces, 40,000 copper pieces, 500 gems averaging of 100 gold pieces each in value, and the following magical items. Potions of Delusion, Green Dragon Control, and Fire Resistance, an Amulet of Proof Against Detection and Location, a Pair of Bracers of Defense, AC-20, and a Gem of Seeing. Building the Army the Bloodstone War consists of a series of engagements that take place over a period of weeks. Using the following timetable to determine when the various events in this campaign take place. Timetable of events. Day 0. Harvest. Completed in Bloodstone Valley. Stone Giant Envoy announces tribute due in two weeks. Day 1. PCs arrive in Bloodstone if traveling by a horseback. Day 7. PCs arrive in Bloodstone if traveling on foot. Day 14, Tribute Collecting Forces Arrive at Bloodstone. Day 21, Punitive Expedition Attacks Village. Day 28, Midnight Attack from Graveyard. Day 29, Last Battle of Bloodstone. Army Rosters The various army rosters, hero, and commander rosters, and descriptions of pre-generated PCs and enemy leaders are all contained in the roster book. The Bandit Army is organized into three brigades, each of which contains four units. Not all enemy units are used in each attack. Refer to the battle description to determine what units are used in what attack. If an enemy unit is defeated in an earlier battle, but some figures escape, add those units to the enemy forces in the last battle of Bloodstone. When the CR of the unit commander is listed on the unit commander slash deputy line on the army roster sheet, there are no separate heroes and commanders roster sheet for the commander. Such commanders are always fighting with their units and cannot fight as heroes. Use a miniature figure of half an inch counter to represent the position of the commander in this unit. The basic units of the army of Bloodstone are presented on three army roster sheets in the roster book. The players have a great deal of freedom in deciding exactly how they will organize their army. The four roster blocks, one page of the Bloodstone regular brigade, can be used to describe one to four units, depending on how the players choose to divide the 48 figures, 480 men, in the brigade. For example, they can be divided into two units of 24 each, four units of 12 each, or two units of 12 and one of 24. The players must fill the FIG space on the army roster sheet depending on their choices. At the start of the war, 240 men, 24 figures of the regular brigade, are proficient with spears and others with longswords. The Bloodstone Militia Brigade consists of 48 figures, 480 people, that represent teenagers, women, and older men who can no longer keep up with the regular brigade. The villagers suffer serious morale penalties if the militia takes casualties. The players can organize the Militia Brigade into different size units, as with the Irregulars. At the beginning of the war, the Militia is considered to be a mob, and its members have no weapon proficiencies. Listed on the same army roster sheet as the Militia is the Huntsman Skirmish Unit. The Huntsmen are skilled archers who live in the woods and mountains of Bloodstone Valley. They are proficient in dagger and longbow, and gain a benefit of 3 to the AR with the longbow because of their superior skill. Once figures are divided into units, those units are permanent for the duration of the war. Players should write on the army roster sheets with pencils, since casualties and training will change the numbers on the form. The morale of all Bloodstone units changes during the war based on the outcome of various battles. The figure listed under ML on the form is the initial value only. Be sure to change it during the course of the war. The players should assign commanders to the individual units. Any PC, Baron Tranth, Lady Christine, and Stefan are all eligible to command. Lady Christine can only command militia. The Baron and any fighter or fighter subclass PCs can serve as a brigade or army commanders. The Baron will agree to any decisions about command. Not other NPCs can be assigned commands, however. The villagers must follow someone they can know or respect. The characters may have recruited soldiers in the valley. An army roster sheet gives statistics for the recruited unit of regulars. Use that block only if appropriate. The characters can only try to make allies of various demi-human races that live in Bloodstone Valley. 
Depending on the success of the PCs' attempts to recruit allies, they may have dwarves, centaurs, and halflings on their side in the final battle. If they are extremely lucky, they may also have pixies. The first three allied units are described on the army roster sheet. If the pixies are successfully recruited, they can be considered a skirmish unit. The players must put together an army roster sheet for them. All allied units arrive with unit commanders who fight with the unit and cannot act as heroes. They will accept any fighter or fighter subclass character as a brigade commander and will follow the directions of an army commander. Preparing for War The citizens of Bloodstone will pitch in to prepare the village for war. The same people that make up the unit above can perform one or two functions in between battles, training, and fortifying. The players must make all decisions about training and fortification, although they can seek advice if they wish. Characters will readily see that the village lies in a defensible position. The Buramis River cannot be forded by anything smaller than a giant, except where a ford is marked on the map of Bloodstone Valley. The clumps of trees nearby are dense and tangled, providing good cover. The gullies are deep and wide enough to provide concealment for as many figures as can physically be placed there. Training An entire unit training for one full week, with the unit commander prison at all times and no major interruptions such as battles, can achieve any one of the following. 1. Improve its AC by 1, maximum of AC 6. 2. Gain a new weapon proficiency, up to maximum class slash level limits. 3. Become a regular unit, militia only. Or 4. Improve its AR by 1, maximum of once per unit. Fortifying. To build fortifications, a crew of 240 people, 24 figures, with a full-time supervisor that has no major interruptions, such as battles, can achieve any one of the tasks listed below in one full week. If any part of the military unit is used to build fortifications, that unit cannot benefit from training during that week. 1. Dig 200 feet of ditch, 10 feet wide by 10 feet deep. 2. Erect 360 feet of 3 feet high stone wall, each foot added to the highest halves, the length that can be built. 3. Modify the buildings for defense, see new battle system rules. Or 4. Construct 210 feet of rampart for 10 feet high wall, wall built separately. New Rules for the Battle System Game The following case is an official addition to the AD&D Battle System Fantasy Combat Supplement and can be added to any game using the Battle System rules at the DM's or referee's discretion. Non-Permanent Fortifications Fortifications can be built either by normal or magical means in a village, city, or castle. Such fortifications have the following game effects. Modify buildings for defense. Buildings with wooden walls can be modified to create special strong points during battle. Modifications including placing arrow slits in the walls and fortifying the walls, doors, and windows so that they cannot easily be destroyed. Game effects. Archer figures can be placed inside the building and can freely fire out in the direction they face. They cannot see anything to either side or behind them. They can fire missiles into figures adjacent to the outside of the walls. Figures outside the walls can make melee attacks on the figures in the building, but those inside receive a minus 3 AC benefit. The buildings can only be destroyed by giants or similarly powerful attacks such as catapults. Construct high walls. Walls at least 8 feet high present problems to any attacker, whether created by human labor or such spell as a wall of stone spell. Melee and missile attacks by any creature shorter than the height of the wall is prohibited, unless those creatures are on a rampant behind the wall or similar structure. Such creatures can attack with missiles and be attacked similarly, with the hardcover bonus of minus 4 to AC when they are attacked. Walls can be climbed with ladders in a single game round. Creatures climbing the ladders cannot attack and suffer a plus 2 penalty to AC when on the ladder. All figures on a ladder in a given game round that are not killed can get over the wall and can fight normally on the following game round. If the defenders cause more HD of damage on its attack than the figures on the ladder possesses, the extra HD of damage destroy the ladder. Creatures climbing a ladder must be in open formation. 
A single figure can build a 10-foot ladder in one hour if there is wood available. Walls can be breached by catapults or other heavy missile fire such as rocks thrown by giants. A heavy catapult or stone giant can breach one inch of wall per hit. A wall is considered to be AC-10 for this purpose. Hill giants and light catapults are only half as effective and breach one inch of wall per two hits. Magical spells such as transmute rock to mud work according to spell description or battle system game case magic as appropriate. When walls are breached, creatures standing behind the walls suffer full damage from the attack. Creatures on a rampart behind the walls take double damage from the attack. Ditches and Moats Whether these obstacles are created by physical labor or dig spells, they restrict movement on the battlefield. A ditch or moat, a ditch filled with water, provides an obstacle to all creatures that are not at least 75% as tall as the ditch is wide and whose movement rate does not equal at least 150% in inches the ditch's width in feet. Example, a 10 feet wide ditch does not impede ogres, 9 feet tall, or wargs, MV, 18 inches, but does impede creatures that are less than 7.5 inches tall or have MV less than 15 inches. Less than 15 inches. A creature only needs to meet one of the two conditions, size or MV, to avoid being affected. Of course, creatures that do not travel in the ground are not affected by the ditches. A creature that is affected by a ditch or moat is affected according to the rules in movement and combat. A creature that would otherwise not be affected by a ditch or moat is affected if the immediate other side of the ditch is occupied by an enemy unit in closed formation. Non-aquatic creatures will not enter a moat. A moat can be abridged with simple wooden platforms. If wood is available, four figures can make one bridge up to 12 feet long in one hour. Each additional six feet of bridge doubles the time requirement. One figure can cross such a bridge at a time. Two figures are needed to carry the bridge to the moat and lay it across. It takes one full game round to cross it. Recruiting Allies There are four demi-human communities in Bloodstone Pass Valley. Centaurs, Dwarves, Halflings, and Pixies. All except the Pixies suffer under the tyranny of the Bandit Army. The Pixies don't care what's going on, but just might come to aid the adventurers if they are convinced it's a good joke. See Chapter 2, Encounter A, to determine under what conditions the Pixies might aid the village. Unless the players were exceptionally good sports in that encounter, the Pixies will not join the war under any circumstances. The centaurs, dwarves, and halflings have been bullied into paying tribute and hate the bandits passionately. However, their relationships with the humans have always been a little cool. Although the current baron has been friendly, some of his predecessors have been heavy-handed in their dealings. The demi-human communities also believe that the bandit army is far too strong to fight. As a result, they are generally skeptical and unwilling to join the war effort. If the adventurers meet the demi-humans when traveling to Bloodstone and aided them as described in Encounters in Chapter 2, the demi-human communities welcome their arrival. Otherwise, they are carefully neutral in their reactions. Have the characters present their case, then make an encounter reaction check to see how the demi-humans respond. Increase or decrease the modifier by 10% depending on whether the players presented their case effectively or not. If the check result is less than 76, the demi-humans are not interested in joining the war effort. If the check result is 76 or greater, the demi-humans agree to join. They say that it will take them two weeks to prepare a fighting unit to send to the defense of Bloodstone. Regardless of timing, if the demi-humans are persuaded to send allies, those allies arrive no later than the morning of the last battle. If the adjusted die score is 25% or less, the demi-humans order the humans out of their community and tell them never to return. On any score between 26 and 75, the demi-humans say that they will reconsider if the characters win some battles on their own. 
This adventure does not detail the demi-human communities, nor provides much information about their leaders. It is not strictly necessary for this adventure to have that detail, but you can develop these communities on your own so that they will be part of your campaign world. Note that rosters for the demi-human forces are included in the roster book. Thank you for listening to this audio reading of Bloodstone Pass, Chapter 4. I hope you enjoyed, and have a great day. Best regards, Reed.